Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the World of Tomorrow Negotiating a Better Future, the 11th edition of SOT Schools of Tomorrow events, the first one that is virtual, fully virtual in fact. Beacon House started with School of Tomorrow non-profit events in 2000 as a part of Trusted Director North, Beacon House School System. I'm associated with, associated with Beacon House since last eight years. I'm based in Islamabad, Pakistan. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the live session, Approach to Learning. We have with us Mr. Lance King. He's joined us from New Zealand. Welcome, Lance. Thank Lance, you, has been, Lance has been teaching since last 35 years with a special focus on third thinking and learning skills. And he is known internationally as an author, teacher, and a workshop facilitator. He is the creator of the Art of Learning program taught in over 300 schools in 34 countries. And he's a specialist in direct teaching of 21st century skills. Within International Baccalaureate Organization, he has designed and developed approaches to learning framework for MYP and DP, which is currently being implemented in more than 400 schools, IB schools in 150 countries. In today's session, we will be exploring the major changes the schools are required to adopt, keeping in view COVID-19 pandemic and the changes that need to adopt in terms of teaching and learning. And we shall also be looking at self-managed remote learning skills the students need to acquire. So over to you, Lance. But before Lance begins, uh, I would just like to tell the viewers that they are welcome to ask questions and we will be able to take your questions towards the last 10 minutes. So over to you, Lance. Excellent. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, I'd like to start by um, giving a warm thank you to the Beacon House School Group who uh, have organized this conference and um, invited me to participate as a presenter. And um, and also to Sophia Kasim, who has helped guided me over the last few days through this complex um, uh, working online remote learning uh, situation uh, as a remote conference. And it's very interesting because I imagine a lot of you are parents and I imagine you have been through a similar thing with your own children in the last few months. And learning how to learn remotely um, is not an easy thing, is it? And I think that's the essence of the presentation that I'm going to give today. So mm -hmm. this, this is my um, details. That is my website. You can see on the screen there. And there are a lot of resources there under the ATL tab. Now, ATL stands for Approaches to Learning, which if you are in an IB school, that is the Thinking and Learning Skills program specifically for IB schools. But if you're not in an IB school, you can still use the resources on my website. Uh, you just don't call it ATL. You call it 21st Century Skills or Competencies. It's all the same information. That is my email address. You're welcome to send me any questions after the session if you wish. That is my Twitter name. You're welcome to look, follow me on, tweet, on Twitter. And that is my Facebook page that I use for various things. As Sophia said, I live in New Zealand, up here at the top of the world. And I spent, have spent the last 25 years traveling around the world, running workshops for students, for teachers, and for parents. Over 250,000 students have been through my workshops. And what I've learned from all that is uh, the challenges that students face in school are pretty much the same, no matter where they are. But the challenges that we've all been facing for the last three months have been a completely new set of challenges. And I think education needs to change post-COVID um, to, to bring in the benefits that we've learned from the struggle with COVID-19. So that's where I want to start. What did the COVID-19 lockdown show us? Well, first, what happened, if you remember back to March, maybe that's when it happened for you. It certainly was March here in New Zealand. The first thing that happened was everyone is locked down at home and suddenly teachers have to um, provide learning at, for children at home. And the very first thing that we discovered was that most teachers were poorly prepared to enable students to learn their subject matter remotely because it was a novel thing. It was a unique thing. It wasn't something that they'd spent a lot of time on before, before COVID remote learning was more of a novelty and an addition, an extra. Uh, suddenly it became the, the predominant pedagogy. 
um, teachers discovered that they weren't familiar with all the good quality websites for the delivery of their subject matter, and they discovered that they were untrained in how to design engaging lessons that capture students' attention. But, but luckily they were teachers and they were skilled at adapting and changing and moving quickly and it wasn't too long before they um, started producing lessons and sending them home to students and then they discovered the next part which of course is that students were poorly prepared to manage their own remote learning. Um, it's just not something that they had had to do very much prior to COVID-19. And we discovered that a lot of students had not been taught the skills of self-effective self-managed learning. They hadn't practiced self-managed learning to the point where they had mastery of it. And it wasn't a priority in their school prior to COVID-19. It wasn't a priority. Becoming a self-managed learner was kind of like an extra, an additional extra, wasn't it? Well, now I think it has become the, the predominant pedagogy for the world. And not just during the lockdown or during the pandemic crisis, but post-COVID as well. And I think it all comes down to helping children learn the skills of self-management is actually a very big topic. You know, th those skills are huge. There is a vast range of skills that enable someone to learn well in a remote environment. But you've got to think, why would we do that? Why would we teach a thinking and learning skills program? What is the specific purpose? And I think the specific purpose is to help develop self-managed learners through teaching students a full curriculum of thinking and learning skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, um, creative thinking skills, media literacy skills, information literacy skills, social media skills, a huge range of skills that they can then bring to bear on any learning program independently and remotely. And then obviously we want the students to practice those skills when they are learning subject matter in school. And we, I think we need to make successful self-management of learning an objective of summative assessment with opportunities for students to practice getting better and better at self-management and to have good standards to aim for. At what level are they with their self-management and can they improve? And to me, it's all about helping children to realize they have some control over the success of their own learning. Because if you think about it, think about a child at school. Can you remember when you were at school? What things did you have control over when you were at school? What things do your children have control over at school? I mean, do they have control over who they're taught by? or what they're taught, or when they're taught, or where they're taught, or how they're taught, or who sets the tests, or who marks the tests? Of course not. Students have no control over any of those things. And unfortunately, for some students, that can result in a feeling of helplessness, like there's nothing I can do. I'm completely passive. And I think we teach students how the skills of thinking and learning to show them that there are two factors that are actually totally in their control in any learning situation. And the first is obviously how much effort they put in. Effort is the, is the single thing that everyone's always trying to help children to put in more effort. But it's also, it's not just that, because it's the way in which that effort is used is vitally important. I call this the strategies they use. So children have control over learning good strategies for things like time management. Do they have good time management strategies? Are they good at setting up their week's work? Are they good at getting through the work? Listening and concentration. What are their listening skills? How good are they at concentrating? Making notes, summarizing information, um, and then being able to turn that information into understanding understanding, reading for understanding, turning things into your own words and explaining them to others. Obviously, students need to remember well, they need to be able to set and achieve goals, they need to be able to deal with pressure and stress, and they need to be able to do what I call failing well. And I mean, this is just a selection of skills. There are a huge number of skills that I think all children need in order to take control of the success of their own learning. And so I, just to sum it up, I think any thinking and learning skills program is all about helping students, focusing students on factors to improve success that are in their control. And I mean, why do we need that? Well, if you think about the world that we're in, there, um, there are the key skills that everyone in the world has been focused on, the key skills for education, for learning, and for all future careers. If you look, I've just got a list here of some of the papers that have been produced recently in the last five years or so on this very question. What are the best skills that students need to succeed in education and beyond? You're welcome to 
have a look at those. Oh, I do have some notes for this session. We'll be putting up the link for the notes at the end of the session, and all this information is in those notes. So why are those skills important? Well, obviously, it's to do with employment trends. Now, there are some generalizations that have been around for a long time, and I think they're generally true, that children in the future will have many, many more career changes than, um, for example, I've had in my life. Co changing careers rapidly and regularly is a much more common feature these days. Um, the creation of jobs that haven't yet been invented. Um, in my family, my daughter's first job was as a social media marketing manager for an app development company, the kind of job that just could not have existed five years ago, 10 years ago. And it's helping children to gain the skills they need to take jobs that haven't been invented, which I think is a key task for school today. On the other side, of course, un youth unemployment, um, between 15 to 24-year-olds, unemployment levels are very, very high in the world today. And the fourth trend is a trend away from, from permanent contract employment. Um, over 60% of all workers lack any, find, any permanent form of employment. Here is a map of the world, and the darker red areas are showing the higher concentration of workers who don't have a permanent contract uh, for their work. And so they have to be adaptable, changeable. They have to be able to rethink, retool, relearn constantly in order to be employable. If you look at the changing nature of work, the skills that are trending up, the most important ones are, are non-routine cognitive skills. In other words, thinking skills, but where it's not routine thinking, where the thinking doesn't change day by day, it's where the thinking and the problems change daily. And so it's being adaptable, being flexible, being able to think in a new environment with new data every day. Those are the, the jobs that are trending up. And of course, a lot of this is due to the rise of robotics taking over manual work in particular. I've got an interesting little clip here for you um, about robotics. It's only a minute long. Have a look at this because this clearly shows the advancement of robotics worldwide at the moment. And here's a whole team of robots pulling a truck. Isn't that interesting? So the point of the exercise was to show that, that robot labor is will be replacing human labor in probably not the most basic jobs, but certainly the, the best paid laboring jobs will be taken by machines because machines like that can work 24-7. This is a slide showing the risk of jobs being replaced by automation. It is different in different countries from the high of 85% in Ethiopia, 77% in China, 72% in Thailand, 47% um, in the United States. The OECD average is 57% of um, risk of jobs being um, replaced by automation. And if we look at the digital world, I won't bore you with all the details, but this is data from January 2019, and it just shows the trends that I'm sure you're all familiar with. There's seven and a half billion people, or the word January 2019, nearly four and a half billion internet users, and over three billion mobile social media users. But it's actually the growth that's interesting. Look, the po population growth is only 1.1%. Internet users is 9.1%. Mobile social media users is 10%. Those things are growing rapidly. And you see this in graphs like this. Evolution of daily time spending, spent using the internet, obviously trending up. Mobile share of total internet time, obviously trending up. Evolution of mobile data consumption, it's now in an exponential rise. Social media, 42% of of the total population of the world are active mobile social media users. Now, that's an extraordinary statistic, I think. Um, social media users over time, obviously trending up. 
day spent using social media, obviously trending up. Social media on mobile is trending up. This, I think, is the most useful slide. Look at this one. This shows that the biggest platform in the world is obviously Facebook. But as at January 2019, Facebook had 2.3 billion people um, on Facebook. And uh, this, of course, then r brings up the problem of data security and data use. I am sure you all heard of the company Cambridge Analytica that influenced both the Brexit vote and the Trump election, um, and um, those kinds of things to do with data stripping and manipulation and use of data. I think we need to teach children, especially about social media identity and social media security, because these things are going to be seriously important. Here are some of the trends that um, uh, people, I have researched a lot of trend setters around the world and predictions of the future, and I've kind of condensed it into this list. These are the trends that most people seem to agree on, that by 2030, obviously automation will be uh, much more prevalent than it is today. Buses, cars, taxis, trains, aircraft, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, manual, excuse me, manual work and permanent contract will probably work, will probably disappear. Artificial intelligence will be involved in all aspects of life. I mean, it already is, isn't it? I mean, those of you that have a Netflix subscription, do you have Netflix where you where you are? Netflix, I think, was the, one of the very first companies to use a predictive algorithm to work out what people wanted to watch. And then they designed a show to meet what people wanted. The show was House of Cards, the American version, and that was the first show, TV series, that was ever produced based on the workings of a predictive algorithm. And now, of course, if you're on Netflix, it brings up constantly all the things that Netflix thinks you want to watch based on your viewing history. That's artificial intelligence. Um, most work will be contracted and most workers will be freelance, involved in digital collaboration to solve specific problems at specific specific times. And the way in which people will get selected for those kind of jobs is obviously based on their experience and their knowledge, but the selection will, of course, be through social media. It'll be driven by social media. At that point, your social media identity will be as important and maybe even more important than your real life identity. And this is a very important point that I think young people don't really understand. Most young, excuse me, most young people still treat social media as something like a game. Well, unfortunately, it's not a game. You know, every single thing you post is there forever. And if the service is free, then you are the product. Your data is being sold. These are things that children need to realize. Lastly, the primacy of acquired knowledge will be superseded by the skills needed to find information, learn, adapt, create, and problem solve. It's those skills that are the skills needed for the future, and never more so than in a post-COVID world. This is a graph of a change in work hours expected by 2030. United States on the left, Western Europe on the right. If you look at the dark blue bars, you see that technological skills, social and emotional skills, and higher cognitive skills skills will be it will be an increase of up to 60 percent um, increase in hours worked in those areas by 2030. Um, Andreas Schleicher of the PISA organization summed it up really well when he said, the world economy no longer rewards people just for what they know. The world economy rewards people for what they can do with what they know. It's the doing that counts, which is skills, of course. And most countries have recognized this already and have built in skills um, requirements into their curriculum. This is the Australian cur curriculum. It has seven general capabilities. Finland has their transversal competence. I'm not going to go through these in any detail. You can see them in the paper that I've, you, you, the notes that you'll get. But just have a look at what, how many countries are building in 21st century skills or competencies into their curriculum. Ireland's doing it. Japan's doing it. What to learn and how to learn. Cultivation of motivation to learn. Skills to think and make judgments. Mexico has them in their curriculum. New Zealand even has them in their curriculum. They call them key competencies. Wales has them. Canada has them. This is a nice framework. Look at this. Creativity and innovation. Critical thinking. Collaboration. Communication. Character. Culture and ethical citizenship. And computer and digital technologies. All skills for the 
the future, but a nice package of skills, I think. USA has them in their Common Core State Standards. Argentina has them. Kazakhstan has them. Hong Kong has them. India has them. Singapore has them. 21st Century Skills Framework is very big in Singapore. Vietnam. Here we have self-management, self-study, communication, cooperation, problem-solving, and creativity. Once again, 21st Century Competencies. China has them in their self-management and learning to learn. Um, also, big organizations like the Council of Europe has competencies for democratic culture. European Commission has key competencies for lifelong learning. UNESCO has them. World Economic Forum has them. And this is the last one. This is the most complex framework I've seen in a long time, is the OECD Learning Framework. They're all just frameworks of people trying to work out what are the most important skills that are going to benefit our children in their future. And, of course, the IB schools, I think, are leading this and always have been with their ATL skills program. ATL, of course, stands for Approaches to Learning. If you're in an IB school, you'll be very familiar with the learner profile, which is a sum of characteristics of a great forward-thinking learner. And if you look at that and you pull out the skills required to achieve those attributes and characteristics, you could sum them all up and say they're the skills of the self-managed learner, which if you pull out the specific skills, then those are the ones we teach at ATL. In the IB situation, there are five main categories of ATL skills that go through all the programs, um, all the IB programs, they're communication, social, self-management, research, and thinking. And in 2012, I had the task of turning that basic framework into a more complex framework for MYP. So that's where these 10 clusters of skills for MYP came from. And But still, you know, that if you're talking about communication skills, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What are the communication skills? Because there's many, many different communication skills. So the real work that I did back in 2012 was teasing those out into specific skills practices. And I came up with 134 specific skills practices to um, to, to develop all those 10 clusters of ATL skills. So across programs in the IB world, there is a framework of skills for PYP, one for, eight for MYP, and one for DP, but they're all based on the same five ATL skill categories. If you're interested in any of this, you can get these frameworks off my website. I have um, the full frameworks there that you can access any time. I also have broken down the MYP framework into what I call the core generic, the most basic skills, and the subject specific skills. So if that's of any use to you, please um, go and have a look and, and grab those off the ATL section of my website. This is what the Excel spreadsheet kind of looks like. You can't, won't be able to see it very well, but it's got um, mechanisms for you to use to design a program of skills across your school. I won't say any more about that. And this is the one for DP. But getting back to countries' comparisons, uh, to PISA in 2015, these were the overall rankings for PISA in 2015 in the three areas of science, reading, and mathematical literacy. And if you look at that list of countries, you'll straight away notice that eight out of 12 of them are Asian countries. And I think I've written quite a bit about this. There are some amazing learning revolutions happening in Asia that are not necessarily happening in other parts of the world. But when people look at this, most people look at this and pull out Finland, because Finland is always seen as the country that is uh, more of a kind of a Western approach, maybe, um, and doing brilliantly at what they're doing. So I've got a little clip here to show you what's happening in Finland. Just very short. Have a listen to this. We are putting a lot of emphasis on the early detection of any difficulties and problems that the students in the Finland schools make. And this is a very different policy to many other countries where these measures are designed in a way that they are implemented only when the problems have uh, emerged and, and are, are too visible. But we don't think like this in Finland. I think we believe in this early intervention to make sure that those who are likely to be in trouble will be uh, recognized early and provided uh, help and support as uh, quickly as possible. So think about that. What he was saying, if you notice the children in that in that clip, they look to me to be about 8 to 10 to 12 years old, maybe. So in Finland, what they have is every child has the opportunity to be a special student, to have special 
uh, coaching. And so what it is all about is diagnosing every student in terms of their learning needs, what they're good at and what they're not so good at, and then having remedial work for those children to do to actually build up their skills. So it sounds very much like an ATL program as in the IB schools. Um, and in fact, if you go back with PISA, back in before 2018, I think the previous survey, I think it was 2016, one of the conclusions that they drew was this one here. Now, what this is saying is that students who use appropriate strategies to understand and remember what they read perform hugely better than other students. In fact, two full school years ahead of students who use these strategies the least. Two years ahead. And that's only two strategies, understanding and remembering. How do you, understand, how do you teach someone how to understand something? Well, surely that's got to be teaching them how to read information or hear information or view information, summarise the key points in a, in a way that makes sense for them, and then explain those key points, turn those key points back into their own sentences and explain them to someone else so that someone else understands them. Now, that's how you build understanding, by taking key information and turning it into sentences in your own words. So that's a skill. It's a strategy. It's something people have to learn and practice. And remembering, well, remembering goes with understanding, doesn't it? When you understand something well, remembering it is relatively easy. But you might need some techniques of connecting information to previous things that you've learned before, looking for patterns, looking for structures, looking for ways in which you can hook the information mentally. But that's just two strategies, understanding and remembering two out of hundreds, and yet those two strategies make a significant difference to students' learning, put them two, two full school years ahead of students who use those strategies the least. So I think the key priorities for student learning for the 2020 to 2021 school year have to be all the strategies and skills of remote self-managed learning. Um, things like time and task management, they have to be able to organise their time, organise tasks, prioritise, sequence, um, break tasks down, set goals, uh, timeline things, plan. There's a huge number of things in time and task management, looking at the important versus the urgent, separating them out, all those kinds of things, to-do lists, all those kinds of things. Once you're really good at time management, you've still got to learn about self-motivation, persistence, perseverance, getting yourself to do tasks that you really don't want to do. How do you do that? Are there some skills in that? Overcoming procrastination. Everyone in the world procrastinates. But of course, everyone knows how to overcome procrastination too, don't they? Because I'll bet there'll be some times you don't procrastinate. That's worth exploring. If you can work out how you do it sometimes, maybe you can use that same strategy in other areas. Learning from failure, what I call failing well, is a huge technique for students to learn. Creating and maintaining digital collaborations. They've got to know how to hook up with other students on their phone or on their laptop and form group and to do group work, not just to chat, but to do actual serious group work. Social media identity and, and security becomes a, an issue once uh, students are spending more time online. Obviously, researching, searching, validating, verifying, identifying data, IP rights, copyright, being a critical media consumer, summarizing key points from presentations, speed reading and skim reading, building evidence-based arguments with critical and creative thinking, writing essays, scientific reports, business reports. All these things are critical skills that I think it's time that we started specifically teaching those skills to students. And then once they've or while they are learning those skills, the best way to practice them is to practice self-management. So I think it's time the students that self-management became a goal in schools so that students could have opportunities to practice self-management in class, um, in online collaborations, and of course outside the classroom, in different um, situations and at home practicing the skills of self-management and actually getting some form of assessment for their ability to self-manage. So how do we teach thinking and learning skills? How do we do that? Once we've got a good curriculum of skills, how do we actually teach them? Well, there's two predominant methods that people use. The first is what I would call explicit teaching, where, where 
a teacher is teaching a specific skill, maybe note making, maybe a listening skill, a concentration skill, a, a media literacy skill, but, but a very, very specific skill, and maybe not even teaching it with subject-based content, teaching it with something really simple so that students get to practice the skill with simple content until they improve their proficiency. And then what we need to do is transfer that skill into class, into subject learning. And this is where the implicit teaching comes in teaching the skills by using them with subject content in normal subject lessons. I think both these methods of teaching are very, very useful. And I think that jumping straight away to expecting teachers to be embedding thinking and learning skills in every lesson is too big a leap. Teachers are mostly uh, often very subject focused rather than process focused. So I think it actually makes sense to have an explicit program of 21st century skills and competencies, which then teachers, once the student has got the skill, then teachers show them how they can use that skill in every subject lesson. So um, I've got a couple of little clips here showing um, explicit teaching of thinking and learning skills excuse me, in different places. The first one is at Tokyo International School, which is a PYP school. So this is very junior children um, learning about the way in which they think and learn. At Tokyo International School, we first of all the culture of thinking and also we teach thinking skills explicitly. What kinds of questions do we get? Where's the setting? 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 Where's the
So I think that's interesting. I think they're going to be catching up and maybe passing the IB schools because they're, they're specifically teaching thinking as a, as a school for students, an accessible skill. So I think teachers, looking back on this, teachers I think need to be able to teach some of these skills explicitly within normal subject lessons, taking five minutes to teach a specific skill and then using that skill in the subject lesson, but also maybe outside normal subjects in their own remedial program. Imagine if you had a remedial program running after school or remotely so children could access the, the exercises remotely so that they could di the teachers could diagnose a certain skill need and then a student could catch up by themselves on that particular need how to, whatever it is, how to research well, how to create a good argument, how to think critically, um, and then come back to class having practiced that skill. And they also need to be able to teach some of these skills implicitly um, by having students practice the different skills in normal subject lessons and by designing lessons around thinking and learning skills. If the skill itself becomes the most important thing in the lesson to get right, then subject matter, all different sorts of subject matter can be used to practice that skill. So I do have some of these exercises, obviously I've written some books on this area, these are ATL skills exercises. I'll just show you the kind of things I'm talking about. Social media identity is such a huge thing for children to realize how important their social media identity is and how to craft that identity to help them meet their own goals. Then social media security becomes a, an issue. Um, are they comfortable with having their data um, used and sold by others? Social action, how to create a good team to bring about a social benefit, how to help disadvantaged people, how to uh, just redistribute resources. Of obviously setting up and forming and managing, maintaining digital groups is an important skill. Uh, helping a team to cohere and work together and all the strategies for maintaining effective groups and teams. Leadership skills, how to be a good leader within a school context and outside of school. Metacognition, which is that higher level of thinking, noticing your own thinking is a very important skill for self-assessment, but also for learning how to improve performance in any area. Time and task management, I won't bore you with all these. Achieve long-term goals, timetabling for examination study, how to write scientific papers, how to do business writing, courage and what I call resilience and failing well. These are all skills that that can be taught. You don't need to get them from me. Those are exercises that anyone can write, um, but exercises getting children to, to specifically learn thinking and learning skills, I think are really, really useful things. But I think that the lesson, the overall lessons from COVID-19 that we all need to implement immediately are things like that teachers obviously need comprehensive training in how to design engaging independent remote learning lessons for their students that utilize the best online resources that are available. They have to become familiar with every website that teaches their subject matter. Every teacher should be familiar with every website, and there's lots of them, and some of them are paid sites, obviously. So the real thing for schools to invest in is schools from now on that need to invest in subscriptions for teachers in all the best school subject sites. They're usually not very expensive, but if you haven't got access to them, how can you use those that material that's on that site in your lessons? And of course, students need to master all the ATL 21st century skills that they need for effective remote self-managed learning. And of course, it would be great if they could master those skills remotely. So that brings me to my last point, which is LALATAT. This is LALATAT. LALATAT stands for Learning About Learning and Thinking About Thinking. This is a platform which was only released last week, lalatat.com. You're welcome to go and have a look. This is what it looks like. It's a platform that has over 300 exercises. It has a full curriculum of ATL 21st century skills, over 300 individual exercises for students to complete either in subject lessons or remotely. And the full release of the entire platform will be September the 1st. And, and it's focused to begin with on the MYP ATL and DP ATL portals. Those are the first two that will be open. And they include the full uh, curriculum of ATL skills. But after September the 1st, the next portals that will be produced will be GCSE, IGCSE, AS, A-level, and then there will be portals specific for specific countries' curriculum of 21st century skills.
The exercises will all be available in five languages, English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, and Vietnamese. And you can get free, um, free demonstration and free full school trials right now if you're interested. This is how the LALATEC curriculum you see on the right-hand side of this table uh, fits well with the DP ATL curriculum, the MYP ATL curriculum, and the overall IB ATL curriculum. It all harmonizes together well. This is what we'll, you'll, you'll find if you go to this portal. This is ATL skills for the DP. You see the categories of skills there. When you click on each one, it breaks it down into individual strands, as we call them. On the demonstration sites, there's only two strands for each skill. Uh, that's The full release will be September the 1st. This is where, where it's up to at the moment. If you click on those, then they break down further into the individual exercises for each skill. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you go to the, the um, have a look at the exercises, then you'll see something like this will turn up. And if you have a look at this, this is on leadership. At the top there, you'll see there's a mastery statement. And the mastery statement shows the highest possible performance that you could expect to master this particular ATL or 21st century skill. It says there, it says, you will know you're at the expert level in the use of this ATL skill when you can confidently lead and motivate members of a team and when other people naturally turn to you to lead in most situations. There's a little bit of a discussion of leadership and then there's exercises like this. This is, this says leadership attitude. Leadership by example means taking on the hardest tasks, the most difficult jobs, the things that have the greatest responsibility that no one else wants to do, willingly and positively. So it just ask children to select what would be a task in this area that no one wants to do and how could you do it there's an exercise on who would you follow I always think that a great leader has more or less the same characteristics as the perfect brother or sister and so I asked them to to write down the characteristics of the perfect brother and sister and then see how they could take an opportunity to demonstrate the same characteristic creating a social action team, um, role models, find role models and see what they, they say about uh, leadership. And here's an exercise called Great Quotes. I'm asking them here to, to look at the saying about, relate, about leadership and describe what each one means in your own words. Things like, great leaders eat last. That's by Stephen Sinek. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them from William Shakespeare. And one of my favorites from Alexander the Great. I'm not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep. I'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. So the children have to turn that into their own words and explain what it means and learn about leadership while they do. So what I'm suggesting is if you're interested, you can go to lalatap.com. And I think these exercises can be used by any teacher to embed specific thinking and learning skills in any subject lesson. They can be used by any student to teach themselves all the skills they need for tasks that teachers set them, uh, for tests, for assignments, for exams at school and at university. By any school, they could use the LALATEC curriculum as a full curriculum for a complete standalone ATL or 21st century skills program. By any parent, any parent could use these skills to help their children develop all the skills they need for success at school and in every career in the future. And of course, by any person, any person who wants to improve their 21st century skills can use this platform. So here are the free trials. Um, you go to, you, you'll find out, go to lalatet.com. If you click on the free demo trial, you get a one month demonstration portal. If you click on the free full school trial, you can get a trial for one month for no obligation for your entire school, all, all your students. So you're welcome to go and do that. So um, this is the, I'm just about finished. So this is the remote learning revolution, as I call it, the notes that are available. Um, you will get the link shortly after I finish. But if you want to go and have a look, you've got to, rather than give you the link, it's about, it's very long. Um, go to my website, which is taolearn.com. Go to my ATL resources page. Scroll down until you find the heading, the remote learning revolution. Click on that and you have, it's quite a, big article. It's a few pages long, but I think it spells out everything I've been saying in this presentation and more, probably more eloquently than I can say it tonight. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you got something useful out of that. I'm um, happy to take questions. Uh, if you can send them to Safia, I will close down my presentation now. Okay. Lance, we've got a few questions here for you. I think this looks like a question coming in from a parent. A parent asks, 
that uh, keeping in view what all you have said today, what will be the role of a parent to equip children with 21st century skills? Well, I guess that depends on what role that the school is going to take. Obviously, if the school has got a really good 21st century skills program or an ATL program, then all a teacher, all a parent needs to do is kind of back that up. But I think for, for parents, um, one of the big concerns is in moving from a focus on subject matter to a focus on the process, they sometimes think that why, why are you learning these skills? Surely you should be learning more biology. Surely you should be learning more English language. Why are you focused on these communication and et cetera skills? But you see, the thing is that the the more 21st century skills or the more proficient children get in their 21st century skills, the more effectively and more efficiently they learn their subject matter. So a focus on skills will actually improve grades and scores and all the things that parents love to, to, to look at. So if your school has a good program in place, then all you've got to do is kind of back it up and help children to realise that practising skills will benefit uh, subject grades and marks in the future. But if the school doesn't have a good program, then sites like I've just shown you are places that you can go and you can work with your children, learn the skills alongside them and help them to learn the skills they need to succeed. Yeah, thank you so much, Lance. So do you want to say that, uh, does it mean that the school has to definitely work in collaboration with the parents also for them to understand that what are the skills they're teaching so that uh, their learning is aligned and their teaching is also aligned? Uh, I absolutely, absolutely. And parents often feel they're a little bit out of, out of connection with where the school is going. So yes, it's very, very important for schools to keep, keep parents in the loop and help parents to realise that they too could benefit from learning some of these skills. I mean, I run lots of parent workshops and I really enjoy working with parents because parents are usually open to good ideas, but sometimes they feel a little left out of the loop, I think. All right. There's the next question we have, and uh, uh, they say that is the learning or using the skill more important or is it more important to perfect the skill? Is it important just to learn the skill or is it important to perfect the skill? Well, I mean, perfection is, is is kind of an unrealistic concept in any area. In any area, what you have to do is develop the proficiency in the skill that's going to help. Oh, as a student, develop the proficiency in the skill that's most going to help you to actually perform well in your school subjects. So, I mean. Children, I think, are very pragmatic. They will use something that works, and but they'll only use it up to the point that it is working well enough for them. And, and I don't think we should ever be looking necessarily at pushing every student to a mastery level in every skill, not in any way. I mean, I think children are actually pretty good at managing their own learning if they're given the right tools. In all my work in 25 years, I've discovered that most children's learning failure, when children are not succeeding well at school, it's usually because of process skills. It's not because they're not smart enough and it's not because the subject, they don't understand the subject, it's because they don't have the right processing skills. And so I think a, a focus on processing skills can, can um, boost performance in all areas, but I don't think it's necessary to go to mastery in every skill. It's quite, I think it's quite good to have a mastery statement to work towards, but we don't need every student to master every skill, but we need every student to practice every skill. Yeah, I completely agree with what you've said. It's important to provide them with the tools which will help them achieve those skills. That is the more important thing. Okay, one very interesting question uh, that we have for you is, they say that, uh, the question says that uh, we know that the world is progressing towards more of technology and everything. Still, there is some kind of reluctance from parents and the other bodies towards online classes which we have all adopted nowadays so why do you think that is there oh i mean i can totally understand it you know so many parents are feeling like they are being distanced from their children because their children are at school and then they're on their device and the parents are getting shut out there is no attachment to parents anymore they're getting shut out and well it's a very big topic attachment and i i do address that in some of my writing but but um I think that also what happens is children, 
You know, it's the whole thing of one child on one device doing work by themselves is going to be isolated, is going to be lonely, is going to feel left out. And so I think this is where the whole COVID-19 thing from teachers kind of fell down. To me, what teachers needed to be promoting for students was group work. It always needs to be group work. But you see, most children are on their phone with their friends 24-7 anyway. So imagine if they had their laptop to work on here, and next to it they had their phone on a little stand, and they had a group of three other students on their phone. And so they're doing group work on their computer, but they're talking to their friends about the work that they're doing. So they're utilizing that, 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 that chat thing that they do all the time anyway, but they're utilizing that in a group to achieve um, serious learning remotely, and I don't see, I didn't see that used enough. Um, I think that um, that too many kids ended up isolated by themselves with a big list of stuff they had to do, and um, they just couldn't be bothered doing it. With a group of friends who are all focused on the same outcome, maybe that would have been much more motivating, and they could have still had their chat, and they could have got the work done. Okay, so it's more about collaboration. You are emphasizing on. Yeah, on collaboration, that the work has to be more collab collaborative for the students so that they're more focused and that will also channelize their energy and their resource towards the right direction. Okay, thank you so much for answering these questions. So Lance, it was a very interesting session and we've been receiving a number of comments and they have all really appreciated what you've said. So if you want to conclude the session, what all you've said, it's more about, um, uh, it's, I, I would conclude it in the sense that we just don't only need to learn in these days, we also need to unlearn so many things because it's a non-routine cognitive skills which are trending and uh, metacognition is a skill of self-learning management. So it's basically focusing towards 21st century skills which are more of a creative thinking skills, self-management, self-study and learning to learning learning to learn skill. I think that's a very important uh, concept you've come up with and a very interesting phrase you've come up with, learning to learn skills, which is something that is required to be taught to children, not only at school, but also at home to make them not just lifelong learners, but also to help them understand and, uh, you know, to understand what they're doing and also be able to remember what they're doing or what they're reading or what they're learning around them because that's a skill we really need to teach our children to understand and then to remember what all they're doing. That's an important strategy they have to learn. Uh, we need to teach them self-managed learning, which is a very interesting uh, concept where they all have to take the charge of the learning, the responsibility of the learning, and they have to move ahead with that. I really like the concept you talked about feeling well. Uh, definitely nobody can be successful always, all in his life, all the time. We all fail. If you make an attempt to do like 100 things in a day, if I'm genius, even then I would fail in at least three to four things which I'm attempting. So the most important thing is to learn from my mistake, the mistake that I've done, the way I have failed and not to repeat it the next time and to make it a better practice for myself for future and um, uh, the 21st century skills which you've talked about, about being uh, you know, digitally uh, well also and learning to learn is a very interesting concept. Anything you would sure. like to want to learn? Well, you brought up the, the failing well. Um, I'll put in a little plug here. I, my first book for parents was called The Importance of Failing Well. So if anyone is interested, I've written a whole book on it and it's available on my website. So yes, failing well is something I'm very, very interested in. And I've been, it's been part of my teaching for 20 years um, all around the world. So I've helped a lot of children and parents and teachers, I think, to learn how to um, make sure they don't just they don't just notice what doesn't work. They actually put in place strategies to make changes and go back and try again and um, a whole set of strategies to learn from every mistake. All right. Thank you very much, Lance, for being with us. Uh, there's a request for, to the viewers. You are all requested to please fill in the evaluation of the session that you can see on your screens. We would uh, like to, we would like you all to evaluate the session. In the end, Lance, I would like to thank you. I would also like to thank our main sponsors, 
conference lead sponsors, UBL. Without the support, this would not have been possible. Thank you very much, Lance, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.